Hello, people of Lakeview, and welcome to this uh, continuation of our series, The Heart of Judgment, where we are studying through the book of Micah. Today we're going to be looking at Micah chapter 5, which is really the continuation of the second section or, or middle section of the book of Micah. If you remember in chapter 3, we started looking at God's judgment on his people. Um, as God is beginning to look for a people who will be his own, he begins looking at Micah's day and saying, this is not the people that I am calling but then in chapter 4, he looks forward and begins to promise us that in the latter days, he is going to gather this people to himself. The mountain of the Lord will be lifted up. Peoples will be coming to it all around. He's going to gather his people back as a remnant. And then it begins this cycle of looking at the now of Micah's day and how that's going to progress to the later, latter days promised and in kind of some unexpected ways. And we get this, uh, that, that now the problem is that Micah's people have no leader or don't recognize a leader, but later God is going to rescue them himself, but out of exile. Um, now the enemies of God's people are all around, but God has a plan that they know nothing about. And now in chapter five, we're gonna get the third of this now problem, but God sequence. And what God is going to reveal is his ruler, the one who is going to come and fulfill all of the promises we saw in chapter four. And then when this ruler shows up, he's going to be like nothing we've ever seen before. Just like God's plan is unexpected, his ruler is going to be a little bit unexpected as well. In some ways, Micah 5 works like the opening 30 minutes of an old Western movie. When I was growing up, we used to watch old John Wayne and sort of other Western movies. And in the first 30 minutes of any good old Western, you're going to get at least two things. You're going to get a town with some people that have a problem. It, maybe they've got bandits who are invading. Maybe they've got some sort of corrupt sheriff. Anyway, there's some sort of problem that they're not able to deal with. And then you're going to get introduced to a hero. And some sequence, you're going to see him do some sort of probably impossible feat. Maybe he uh, defeats a whole group of bandits by himself. Maybe he, I don't know, wrestles a bear or something. Something that's going to give you the idea that this guy has what it takes to deal with whatever problem he faces. And then at the end of that sequence, the hero is going to show up in the town. And from that moment on, you know it's only a matter of time until the problems in that town are fixed. It's not a question of whether the hero is able to deal with the problems. It's just a question of how is he going to do it. And you can sit back and enjoy the movie in confidence that this hero is going to solve the problems of the people. And that's how we're supposed to feel when we get to the end of Micah 5, that the ruler God has promised. We're not sure how he's going to do it, but we're just going to sit back and watch him deal with the problems of God's people. So let's get into it here. We're starting in verse 1 of chapter 5. And Micah says, Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. There's just so much symbolism packed into these verses. This may be one of the most well-known passages of Micah because it's picked up in the New Testament, right? When the Magi come from the east and show up in Jerusalem and say, where is the one who's to be born ruler in Israel? People remembered this passage and they said, oh, it's, it's Bethlehem. Go, Micah said that ruler is going to show up in Bethlehem, so you should go check there. Um, if, you, if you do a word study on Bethlehem, you're going to find it means a house of bread. And, and you can kind of trace the theme here that the one who is going to be the bread of life is going to come from the city referred to as the house of bread. And, and God ordains the name of this town so that we would understand more of what he's doing. 
But, but the main symbolism as we're reading this passage that we're supposed to be picking up on is the contrast between two cities named here. One hand, on the one hand, you've got a city under siege. In verse 1, we see that siege is laid against us, and, and what you would probably begin to picture there is the city of Jerusalem itself. Partly because that's where all the armies actually went when they laid siege to Judah. It, it actually happens twice in Micah's lifetime that Jerusalem comes under siege. And um, in those times, it's miraculously delivered by God. But here we find that the doom of the city is, is pretty certain. Right? It says that they're going to strike the ruler on the cheek. And the only way you get to strike the ruler on the cheek right, is if you defeat the city. If, you, if the siege is successful and the city falls. That's not going to actually happen for several decades after Micah's time. But the point here is clear. Micah is saying your stronghold, even Jerusalem, your capital, with its walls on the hill and its symbolism of God's presence among you, even that's not going to be enough to save you. Your stronghold will be no refuge. It will fall. But, he says, but look to Bethlehem, this little city, just a few, uh, about 20 miles outside of the city of Jerusalem, says it, it's too small even to be numbered among the clans of Judah. And clans are kind of the division of people below tribe, right? So you remember you've got the 12 tribes of Israel, Judah, Manasseh, uh, Asher, and um, under that you'd have these major families, which would be the the clans, just, just the same thing you would find in an, in an old Irish or Scottish story. Um, and what it's saying is, Bethlehem, you're too small even to be that second level division. You're just this little town of no importance. But from you, I'm going to call forth my ruler. And then he gives it significance in a couple ways. One, simply by picking Bethlehem. He's actually going to be picking up on the fact that, that Bethlehem is the hometown of David. Right? That would be significant to any Jewish reader at this point that, oh, you, you picked the town of our founding king, our greatest king. That's significant. And then he says it's from of old. This ruler is going to be, his coming forth is of old, from ancient days. And so you put that with the hometown of David and what you're going to come to mind is the promise God made to David of old that he would always have a ruler on the throne. In 2 Samuel 7, 16, God says this to David. He says, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established. And, and if we're saying that Jerusalem and the city is going to fall, this promise now comes into question. If, if the city, if the king falls and the, the capital is captured and the people are in exile, is this promise no longer true? And so what God is doing is saying, yes, the city is going to fall, the kingdom of David is going to fall, but the promise I made to David, I'm going to draw forth a new ruler from his hometown to fulfill his promise. Isaiah, who was speaking at the same time as Micah, gives a similar picture in Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. Here's what he says there. Therefore, sh or there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord." or from the stump of Jesse, Jesse being David's father. He's saying, I'm going to bring forth a ruler with wisdom and counsel and might and knowledge to fulfill the promise I made to David. And the picture there is sort of the tree of the kingdom of Jerusalem, of Judah, is cut down. The city is captured. It's under siege. But from the roots, from the promise I made of old in ancient days, I'm going to draw forth a new ruler to care for my people, to fulfill my promises I made in Micah 4, to fulfill the promise I made to David of having a ruler on his throne forever. There's hope still, even while the kingdom of David is destroyed. And then Micah goes on to show us what it's going to look like 
when this ruler comes to fulfill his promises. And he's going to bring back into focus the remnant that he promised to gather in chapter 4. He says here in verse 3, Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. God is promising that, that even though they're going to go into exile, it's only until the one who gives birth. Right? If you remember in chapter 4, this is kind of picking up on that same theme of, of childbirth and birth pains. Right? In chapter 4, he told Israel when they thought they had no leader to cry like a woman in labor. And now in chapter 5, he's saying when she who is in labor gives birth, this ruler is going to come and fulfill all of my promises. And um, the she giving birth here is, is, again, like many of Micah's image, kind of a double image. Again, Israel is promised, is often pictured as a woman. And, and so you can see here that, that who's giving birth is really the people of Israel, the whole storyline of what God has been doing with his people ever since David, ever since Abraham. It's all been leading up to the birth pains for this ruler who's going to come and create this promised kingdom. But that's also going to culminate in an actual physical birth. The birth of Israel's ruler is going to come from the birth of an actual human child, from the Virgin Mary. And this theme gets traced through again so we can understand what God is doing in his story. And when this ruler comes, this picture we get is Glorious. He says he's going to reestablish God's people, and the ruler is pictured as a shepherd, standing over the flock of his people as one who is protecting them from enemies, as one who is caring for them and guarding them and, and bringing them back. And he's going to do all of that in the strength of the Lord. And if you've read the stories leading up to this point, the strength of the Lord has some great background for it. It brings to mind things like the, the power given to the judges when the spirit and the strength of the Lord comes upon them. Men like Samson, who God gave strength and power to kill a thousand enemies with the jawbone of a donkey. Or men like David, who given the strength of the Lord not only to defeat the enemies like Goliath, but to establish a people and to give them protection and rest from the enemies on every side to establish prosperity in this place. That's what this ruler is going to come and the strength he's going to be using. It's not going to be like Micah's day anymore. Again, we're flipping the problems there where the enemies are around on every side. This ruler is going to come and give them security and peace. And, and not just the peace that comes after talking to a good friend about your problems or um, just kind of getting a load off of your mind as you process. No, this is the peace that comes from strength. This is the peace that would come um, when, when Batman walks into a mugging scene in the back alley, right? At the moment there was going to be violence and there's problems and, and all of a sudden Batman shows up and says something probably snarky, probably something like, is there a problem here? Right, and then all of a sudden, there's, there's no more violence, unless, unless maybe Batman's doing the violence. But, but the, the bad guys have no thought anymore of attacking this victim because the strength of Batman has come and established peace in this situation. That's what this ruler is going to do. When he shows up, there's going to be no question, no possibility of harm for his people. And then Micah goes on to give a picture of not only the ruler giving peace to his people, but the, actually the people now working with the ruler to establish and maintain this peace. Here in verse 5, he says, And he shall be their peace. When the Assyrian comes into our land and treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds, and eight princes of men, and they shall shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod at its entrances, and he shall deliver us from the Assyrian. 
when he comes into our land and treads within our border. If you pay attention to the words being used here, this is kind of a poetic picture where you've got these three characters and the the actions of the Assyrian are paralleled to the actions of the ruler and the words that they use, that when they come into our land and tread in our places, and when he comes into our land and treads within our border. And that kind of poetic representation gives you an idea that this isn't necessarily a specific picture of of a discrete event that's going to happen. This is sort of a, an ideology or a sense of what it's going to feel like when the ruler comes. It sort of works like the phrase, um, you don't mess with Texas. Right? That's not a specific description of, of that no one ever messes with Texas. Right? That's, a, that's an idea of what Texas is like and the attitude and the, that speaks to the reality that exists there. It's kind of like saying, when the Assyrian comes, we're going to knock them back. Like that, that's the tone of this passage. That's helpful to note because the Assyrian here is really working as a category. It's a specific example of the general category of just the enemy of God. And we know that partly because when the ruler actually shows up, when Jesus comes, the Assyrian is long gone. Right? Even by the time Jerusalem falls, it's not going to be Assyria. It's going to be the kingdom of Babylon who then is going to fall to the kingdom of Persia. And by Jesus' day, it's going to be the empire of Rome. So it would be meaningless to just say, actually, the ruler is going to beat specifically the Assyrians. But, but what Micah is saying is here is when the Assyrian, the threat of the day, the thing that dominates all of your fears, the thing that just drives all of your political conversations, that, that threatens God's people, when that enemy comes into the land, the people are going to effectively resist them with strength and that security and peace. And the difference between Micah's day, when the Assyrian could do whatever they wanted, and that day, when the enemy, the Assyrian, whoever's filling that role comes in and is resisted is the fact that the ruler will be in the midst of his people. He will be the deliverance. Though they are doing the action, shepherding with the sword, the difference maker is going to be this ruler. The other thing you pick up out of this passage is the fact that the, God's people are now working with him. The contrast to Micah 3 is stark, where God is coming with strength and power to destroy his own people. The end of Micah 3 ends with God promising to plow Jerusalem like a field. But now we see that God has gathered a people who are fighting with him against the enemy. And so the people now dwell at peace and security, not only because they're empowered by the ruler to resist those around, but because the shepherd has led them away from the corruption of chapter three. He's purified his people. He's drawn them to himself. He leads them himself. And now they have the peace that comes from being reconciled to God through this ruler. And now Micah is going to continue on and, and confuse this picture a little bit. Right? If, you've, if we stopped right here at the end of verse six, you might think that the ruler was going to come and just reestablish the nation state of Israel, a physical kingdom with cities and and rulers and princes and shepherds. But um, the rest of this chapter gives a picture that that sounds a little different, that kind of gives you a clue. This may not be exactly the kingdom that you would picture just reading this in Micah's day. In verse 7, he says, Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples, like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, which delay not for a man, nor wait for the children of man. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, which when it goes through treads down and tears in pieces and there is none to deliver. Your hand shall be lifted up over your adversaries and all your enemies shall be cut off. This picture here of of the remnant in the midst of many people or among many nations, that that doesn't sound like a normal kingdom. If you were reading this in Micah's day, you might have a lot of speculation on what that could possibly mean or what it looks like. But but we don't have to speculate because we know this this is a description of how we are right now. 
in Jesus' kingdom, we have not been called to a nation with physical borders and walls and an army, but we are a people that is among many nations. We are still a kingdom, but, but we are not living in a kingdom as Micah would have thought of it. We are a kingdom called to be exiles here, and it's still a kingdom. And, and the question that we might be asking is not how can this be, but how can we have the security promised in the first six verses of Micah while we are still among many nations? And, and that's what Micah is trying to give us a picture of here to describe how that security will look among the nations. Yeah, it might be confusing when you first read this picture of, of the, the two pictures given here of what God's people will be like. They're pictured both as the dew and the showers, kind of the rain coming down on the land, and as a lion. Right, on the one hand, we're, we're sort of a blessing to the nations that are around us. We're the rain that gives growth and that refreshes the land, and, um, and, and there's, a, there's a growth and a goodness to that. And on the other hand, we're a lion, which does none of those things. <laughs> which is described as tearing and destroying and treading down. Uh, but I think that's, that really shouldn't be surprising that, that we are given both of those pictures. Paul gives us a very similar perspective for um, not so much how we're going to relate to the world, but how the world is going to receive us among the remnant of God. In 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16, we're described like this. It says, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. There's, there's a dual reality to what it's like to be in God's kingdom. Some receive us and are blessed by us and see the good that we have. And some are those that we end up opposing. Right? There's a sense in which we are like the lion in the world and we oppose the evil in the world, the evil of racism, of sex trafficking, of the destruction and devaluing of the family, of cycles of addiction. Those are things that we oppose and tear down and act against. And on the other hand, we're to be a blessing to the world around us. We're to be a blessing in our workplaces. We are to love our neighbors. We're to speak with encouragement. We're to care for widows and orphans. We're to be like the dew and the rain that's building and growing. At the same time as, in some cases, we're like the lion that's tearing up. Micah's vision and, and Paul's vision has room for both of those realities. But notice what's common of these descriptions in Micah. Both the dew and the lion are highlighted as being independent from the world around them. Right? When the rain comes, Micah says, it just comes. It doesn't wait for the children of man. If it's going to rain today, it's going to rain today. And there's, there's nothing you or I can do about that. We just check to see what the rain's decided it's going to do. Um, and when the lion comes, he also just does what he wants. When the lion decides it's time to go to the water hole and drink, he just goes and everybody else has got to deal with it. That's what's common here, is that whether we are blessing or whether we are opposing, we are to be independent from the world. It does not matter to our peace and security what happens. It doesn't matter who is elected in this country in November. It doesn't matter how our neighbors react to our efforts to love them, whether they receive them well or are hostile to them. It doesn't matter to our peace and security whether our best efforts to end racism in the world, succeed or fail. It doesn't matter to our peace and security whether the economy recovers or goes into a depression. We are independent from those things. Now, I wanna, I wanna be clear here. Being independent from the world does not mean we are unaffected by the world. Spe especially, it mean, does not mean that we don't care what happens in the world around us. We can and should grieve the problems in the world we see. When, when you read emails, if you're on the LCC prayer chain and hear stories of sickness and difficulty in people's lives, we should be affected by that. We, we should lament lives destroyed by things like per, police brutality and um, the difficulty of living in poverty. We should feel burdened by the devastation of hurricanes that hit the Bahamas. We're commanded to weep with those who weep. And at the same time, while we have tears in our eyes, we are to find peace and to realize that we are 
secure. We have a promise that no enemy can ever overcome us even though we live in a world full of difficulty. It's exactly how Jesus teaches us to live in John 16, 33. This is what he told us. He said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Though we live with no border between us and the fallen world around, when the Assyrian comes, when the enemy opposes, when trials and difficulties and tribulation describe our lives, we are to know that nothing will harm us. We will effectively resist that because God's ruler is among us to deliver us. Now, how is that the case? What is that going to look like? How can we have peace while we live in a world full of tribulation? Micah goes to refocus us on our strength by telling us all the things our peace is not based on. Our peace is not one that comes from that of a normal kingdom. And this is how Micah teaches us. In verse 10, he says, And in that day, declares the Lord, I will cut off your horses from among you and will destroy your chariots. And I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds. And I will cut off sorceries from your hand. And you shall have no more tellers of fortune. And I will cut off your carved images and your pillars from among you. And you shall bow down no more to the work of your hands. And I will root out your Asherah images from among you and destroy your cities. And in anger and wrath, I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey. It's key to notice whose stuff God is destroying in these passages. When I first read this, I thought that, that the destruction listed in verses 10 through 14 was just a picture of what it looked like for God to take vengeance on the nations that did not obey. But on closer reading, I realized that, that the you being addressed in verse 10 has not changed from the you being addressed in verse 9. In verse 9, he says, your hand, your people's hand will be lifted up over your enemies. And then he goes straight into verse 10. He says, I will cut off your horses from among you. He's going to destroy his own people's horses, his own people's cities, his own people's stronghold. And we see that God is removing from his people everything that they might think they need to be secure. He's removing their military strength, their horses, their chariots, their strongholds. He's removing their idols and their sorceries, which they would look to rather than turning to God. He's even removing their cities, their economic strength, not just the, the strongholds and the walls you would have in a city, but, but cities were the center of economic wealth. And, and he says, I'm going to take all of that away from you, and I'm still going to execute vengeance on all the nations that did not obey. The strength of Micah 5 is, is pretty much just like the strength of, of those old westerns. When the hero walked into town, he didn't walk in with a group of soldiers at his back. He didn't walk in with any sort of magical weapon. He didn't walk in with any human power or wealth. He just walked in with himself. And in those stories, you knew that's all it took. That man had what it took to deal with the problems just in himself. That was the only source of peace and security coming. And that's exactly what God is saying this ruler is going to be. It is only Jesus, just himself, that we are to look to for our strength. And he's proved that we can do that. This is the man who defeated our greatest enemy, death itself, by walking out on his own, abandoned by all, not saying a word in his own defense, and won the greatest victory, unexpected victory we have ever seen. The ruler of Micah 5 defies our expectations of what we are looking for and hoping in. Again, you read the first six verses of Micah 5, and, and you can understand why the disciples expected that when Jesus came, he was going to reestablish the nation of Israel. He was going to come like a human king, like David, and, and make a kingdom with a throne and cities and walls and a military. And, and the next so verses 7 through 15 should maybe have given them an idea that, that that might not be what Jesus was going to do, but... But I think we can understand that instinct because even we who live now in light of what Christ has done have trouble, I think. I have trouble 
feeling like my security can really be gained just by Jesus, without any of those other things that come with a normal kingdom. It's easy to sing the song, you can have all this world, just give me Jesus. But we find out if we really believe that when we lose the things we thought we needed in this world, when, when we lose a job, or when we, we lose our health temporarily or, or, or permanently, when there's something wrong with our children or our relatives or, or problems in this world that feel devastating. It feels like God is removing something you absolutely need to have peace and security. And I think maybe what Micah is trying to show us here, that as God is redeeming a people for himself, a people in Micah 3 who have created their own kingdoms and used the things God has given them for their own ends, that, that perhaps the only way the ruler that can shepherd his people to be reunited with him, to be living at peace and security and, and free from the corruption that they have is to take away everything else they thought they needed and be left only with him. When we look for the peace and see Jesus, do we say, yes, that is my peace, that's the security, that's what my hope is based in? Or do we sometimes wish, like the disciples expected, that God had come with a, with a more, little more substance, a little more of that normal kingdom we were looking for? Maybe uh, that, that he would sort of just be fixing our government, that he would have come with a, a military to protect us, or um, some scientists to cure a cancer, or um, an economic plan to deal with the problems that we're facing. When this Jesus, the lamb who was slain, walks into town and says, I have what you need to fix your problems, do you say yes, or do you say, I wish you brought something else? I wish you brought a little bit more. I think the challenge for us as we read Micah 5 and see the picture of this ruler who's going to come and bring peace and security in a way that we did not expect, the question for us is, do we trust God? Now that we know what this hero looks like, now that we know who the ruler is and what he's doing and how he has brought our peace and security, do we trust that? Do we feel just as secure as if he had brought all those other things that we might have thought he needed. All the things that come with a normal kingdom. He brought none of that, but he says that you're gonna be just as secure. The Assyrian is not gonna prevail. You're going to effectively resist him. And a question for us is do we believe him? Do we believe that Jesus is our peace and security? Thank you for joining this week. Hope you'll come back uh, next week as we begin the final section of Micah, looking at God's final address and then resolving in chapter 7 with um, the prophet Micah himself's response to God's speaking. Thank you.